So we've been talking a lot about orthogonality, perpendicularity, and why it's so important to our question of how to project a point onto a subspace. But I don't feel like computationally orthogonality has really come into its own yet. In other words, we understand why it's important, but we don't really understand why it's useful, why it's beneficial. One of the biggest answers to that question when it comes to projection is going to come this week. When we look at how orthogonality can help us to make the process of building our projection matrix much simpler. After all, in the formula for a projection matrix, we end up having to invert, to compute the inverse of the matrix A transpose A. Well, computing the inverse of a matrix, as anyone who's done it by hand will remember, is a computationally very tedious exercise. And it's not only difficult for humans to do with a pencil and paper, it's also really challenging for computer machines to do uh, with electronics. It's not that difficult when the matrices are small, but when the matrices are really, really large, it's a really tough problem to compute. So in the question of facial recognition, where maybe my Facebook friends database has, I don't know, 200 friends in it or something like that, I could potentially have up to a 200 by 200 matrix that I have to find an inverse for in order to build a projection matrix in the usual way. And that sounds like something I don't want to have to do. The computers doesn't like it any more than we would with pencil and paper. So we're going to see this week how orthogonality can actually help us out in a way that will bypass the need to compute an inverse for a matrix altogether. And won't that be nice? So we're going to look at two things. First of all, what can we do if we choose a basis for our subspace, where the vectors we choose for that basis are not only orthogonal to one another, in which case we get what we call an orthogonal or a pairwise orthogonal basis, but better still, could we also shrink or extend the length of each of those vectors in a way that makes its length standardized, make the length each equal to one? So when I have a basis that consists of mutually orthogonal unit vectors, then our basis is what's called orthonormal. And we're going to see, first of all, how orthonormality conveys a lot of computational efficiencies onto our process. We're going to look at how expressing a vector in orthonormal coordinates actually makes it a lot easier to work with. We'll look at um, what advantages a matrix has if its columns are an orthonormal set. And then we'll also finally look at what, what becomes so easy about the projection matrix formula when we choose an orthonormal basis for the subspace onto which we're projecting. And then after that, we turn to the existence question. Well, how do we know that an orthonormal basis for a given subspace actually exists? And if it does exist, how can we find one? We're going to look at two different methods for how to find an orthonormal basis for a given subspace. The first is the traditional Gram-Schmidt process, which you can find in most linear algebra textbooks. But the second one is actually going to be the one that's used in our facial recognition algorithm by which we're going to find the eigenvectors of a matrix to determine an orthonormal basis for a subspace. So first of all, getting back to definitions. We will say that a set of vectors, and here we'll choose a set that has k different vectors in it, we'll call them v1 up through vk. We'll say that that set is orthogonal, or pairwise orthogonal, if each of the different vectors in that set is orthogonal to each of the other different vectors in that set. So if each pair of vectors that I choose that are not the same vector in that set are orthogonal to one another. So in that case, we'll call it an orthogonal set. If in addition to being orthogonal to one another, we also know that taking the transpose of any vector multiplied by itself gives me the number 1, and recall that when we're doing this, what we're really computing is something like the length of vi squared. If that's equal to 1, then we're going to call the vi's unit vectors. Um, and if that's true for all of the vectors in our orthogonal set, then we will call that set orthonormal. So just by way of a couple examples, an orthogonal set might look like this. I've got three different vectors. They're each perpendicular to one another, but their lengths, their norms, their magnitudes might be different one from another. So that we would call an orthogonal set. Orthogonal sets are going to have a lot of the really nice properties that we like. Um, but orthonormal, which is a situation in which all of our vectors not only are mutually perpendicular, but all of their lengths are equal to 1, that's going to be the best that we can possibly have. Let's look at a couple quick examples in R3. Starting with the standard basis vectors, 1, 0, 0, 
0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1. Our standard basis in R3 forms an orthonormal set. But it's by no means the only orthonormal set of vectors that we could form in R3 even. So here's another set, v1, 0, 0, 0.6, v2, negative 3, 0, 4, and v3, 0, 1, 0. We can check that this is a pairwise orthogonal set. In other words, if we take any of these vectors and dot product it with any of the other vectors, we're going to get 0. So this is a mutually perpendicular set of vectors. But it's not orthonormal. The reason it's not orthonormal is that v2, if we take its dot product with itself, does not give us 1. It gives us 25. But we can fix that in the traditional way that we do in working in vectors by dividing that vector by the square root of its dot product with itself. In other words, dividing it by its own length or its own norm, if you like. So dividing by the square root of 25, dividing it by 5, gives me a new vector, negative 0.6, 0, 0.8, which is parallel to v2, but is length equal to 1. And that new set now, v1, v2 hat, and v3, forms an orthonormal set. So now that we know what orthonormality means, what an orthonormal set looks like, what can we do with it? First of all, let's imagine that I have an orthonormal basis for a vector space. And I've expressed a couple of vectors with respect to that basis. So let's say the vector x is equal to x1, v1, plus x2, v2, up to xn, vn. So the xi's are the coordinates of x in the basis of the orthonormal vi's. And likewise, I've done the same thing with a vector y is equal to y1, v1, y2, v2, up to yn, vn. If that's the case, then what's going to happen if I try to take the dot product of x with y? In other words, multiply x transpose by y. Well, this becomes a gigantic FOIL problem. After all, matrix multiplication uh, distributes over matrix addition. And so this transpose, when I multiply it out, I'm going to have to multiply each term from the left by each term from the right, each of these purple components by each of these green components. And that's a huge FOIL problem which we'll represent in the usual way in a gigantic grid. So x1, v1, quantity transpose, y1, v1. is going to give me x1, y1, v1, transpose, v1, and so on and so forth. x2, y1, v2, transpose, v1, da, 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 da. We'll fill in all these different FOIL components, and so on and so on and so on. This is one of those things that we'll only have to do once uh, the long way, because we're going to realize in a second what makes this situation so special. So we fill out all of the FOIL components. And then we remember that our vi's form an orthonormal set. And that means that any time I take the transpose of vi multiplied by vj, in other words, the dot product of the ith vector with the jth vector, if i is different from j, I'm going to get 0, because these vectors are mutually orthogonal one to another. So that means that, for example, v2 transpose v1 is going to be 0. vn transpose v1 is 0. Every off-diagonal element in this big FOIL grid is going to get wiped out because it's going to be a multiple of vi transpose vj, where i is different from j. So just the orthogonality of the vectors in these sets with one another are going to wipe out all of the entries off the diagonal in my little FOIL grid. And so the only entries that can be non-zero are those that are on the diagonal, where we're taking the dot product of one of these vectors with itself. But because the set is orthonormal, we know what happens when we do that, too. The dot product of any of these vectors with itself is equal to 1. So v1 transpose v1 is equal to 1. v2 transpose v2, all the way up to vn transpose vn, those are all equal to 1. And so those entries' contribution to this FOIL is only x1, y1, x2, y2, up to xn, yn. And so when all of the dust settles, x1, x transpose y is merely equal to x1, y1, plus x2, y2, plus all the way up to xn, yn. And therefore, when I express x and y with regard to any orthonormal basis, v1, v2, up through vn, then their dot product is exactly equal to the sum of the products of their components, just like the ordinary dot product when the orthonormal basis that we're working with is the standard basis chosen for rn. In other words, with respect to computing the dot product of two vectors, every orthonormal basis on a given vector space acts exactly the same as the standard basis does. That's pretty cool. But it's not just uh, bases that make being orthonormal really nice. What happens if the columns of a matrix are 
orthonormal one to another. It's going to turn out that then our matrix A is very easy to compute the inverse of in a way we'll see right now. All right, so finding the inverse of a matrix really sucks. It's not a nice process um, computation-wise. If we think about it in terms of uh, a matrix, let's say a two by two matrix here, A, whose columns are the two vectors that we see here. So the purple vector here is 2.5, negative one. The green vector is 1.52. Those are some pretty simple entries for the entries of A. But the inverse of A is already kind of nasty. It's got these nasty decimals. These are kind of rounded off, so it's probably even nastier than, than it appears here. And as we sort of move these vectors around, we can see that in general, there doesn't look like there's much of a relationship between the entries of A and the entries of the inverse of A. Is there anything that we can do about that? Well, first of all, let's think of a situation where the columns of A are orthogonal one to each other. So here in this example, the purple vector 1, negative 1, the first column of A, the green vector 1, 1, the second column of A, A inverse turns out to have some fairly nice numbers in them. 1 half, 1 half, negative 1 half, 1 half. So it actually shares the property that all of its entries are the same in absolute value. One of them has a negative sign. It's the same properties that A has itself. So we suspect that having orthogonal columns makes for potentially a nice way to invert our matrix. But not maybe as nice as it could be, because these numbers over here, these one halves, are not the same as the numbers we started with over here, these ones. Is there a way to fix that? Well, let's take a look at what happens if I grab on one of these vectors and I change not its direction, but its length, its magnitude. So if I stretch this purple vector out so that it's 2, negative 2, maybe, instead of 1, negative 1, you'll notice what happens to the inverse. The inverse still um, has kind of nice numbers in it, but now the first row has been cut in half compared to where it used to be. So when I stretch the first column of A by a factor of two, the first row of A inverse got shrunk by a factor of two. Well, that's interesting. So is there a way, if I can stretch or shrink this enough, that I can make that first row of A inverse be exactly the same thing as the first column of A? Well, let's keep shrinking and see where these two roads converge on one another. Oh, uh, it's right about there. So when the first column here is 0.71 minus 0.71. The first row is 0.7 minus 0.7. That's pretty close. It's probably as close as I'm going to do with this little tool. Um, so the first row of A inverse is the same thing as the first column of A. Well, that's convenient, but the second row doesn't have that property. So let's tweak the second column of A in a similar fashion. Stretching out the first uh, second column of A will shrink the second row of A inverse. So if I want them to be the same, I probably again need to shrink that second column as much as I can, and then find out where it matches, and right about there is where it matches. And after I've done all this work, what we find out is that if we just, you know, modulo round off error, that A inverse has the rows that are exactly the same as the columns of A, which means that A inverse is nothing more than the transpose of A. So we have a matrix whose transpose is equal to its own inverse. So if I were to multiply A transpose times A, A transpose would do what the inverse does and give me the identity matrix. That's pretty cool. So here we make the conclusion, or at least the supposition, that if the columns of A are orthonormal, then A transpose is going to act like A inverse in the sense that A transpose times A this matrix times that matrix will give me the identity matrix. So we can conclude that if the columns of my matrix are orthonormal one to another, then computing the inverse of that matrix is no more difficult than computing the transpose of that matrix because they're exactly the same thing. Talk about convenient. The great thing about it is it doesn't matter whether our matrix was square or whether our matrix was rectangular. That the same conclusion holds, namely, even though a rectangular matrix will not have an inverse, the conclusion is still that A transpose times A is going to be an identity matrix. And because A transpose A is so important to the computation of a projection matrix using our projection matrix formula, Having chosen an orthonormal basis for our subspace, in other words, building the matrix A out of orthonormal columns, is going to make this computation real simple. So starting from the projection formula we know, 
If the columns of a matrix A are a basis for a subspace S, then we can compute the projection matrix onto S using this formula, A times the inverse of A transpose A times A transpose. But if that basis is orthonormal, then according to what we just saw, A transpose times A, even though A is not a square matrix, A transpose A will be a square matrix, and namely, if its columns are orthonormal, will give us the identity matrix. And if there's one matrix that's simple to invert in the world of linear algebra, it's the identity matrix. The identity matrix is its own inverse. And so the formula for projection becomes merely A times A transpose. And isn't that nice? We don't have to compute any pesky inverses. If we choose an orthonormal basis for our subspace S and make that orthonormal basis the columns of A, then all we have to do to compute the projection matrix onto that subspace is to take A, multiply it by A transpose, and we're done. Let's look at this in practice. So in R3, let's suppose that I choose the subspace S, which is the plane 4x minus 3z is equal to 0. And if I am lucky enough to pick a basis for S which is orthonormal, then I'll be able to use this simplified formula. So that's the cost of using the simple formula, is that we have to produce an orthonormal basis for S. We're going to look at how to do that in general in the next video. But for now, let's suppose that I get really lucky and I choose v1, 1, uh, 0, 1, 0, that's a vector inside of s, and v2, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, also a vector inside of s, which happens to be orthogonal to v1, and v1 and v2 are both unit vectors, therefore v1, v2 is in fact an orthonormal basis for s. So when I build my projection matrix using those vectors as the columns, and I compute a transpose a as if I were to use the general formula for p, I'll notice that A transpose A gives me, if I multiply first row, first column, I get 1. First row, second column, I get 0. Second row, first column, 0. Second row, second column is 0.36 plus 0.64. Oh, look, it's 1. So A transpose A, that matrix which we would have to otherwise invert in our projection formula, is nothing more than the identity matrix. And as a result, P, our projection matrix, can be computed as simply as taking our A, this matrix over here, and just multiplying it on the right by its own transpose, and that gives us our projection matrix. So what is P going to be? 0, 1, 0, 0 0.6, 0, 0.8, multiplied by its transpose on the other side, and all we have to do is this matrix product. The result is going to be 3 by 3, which is, you know, it's got a lot of entries in it, but it's not so bad. We do all the multiplications, we get 0 0.36, 0, 0.48, 0, 1, 0, and 0 0.480, 0 0.64. There is the matrix which defines for us projection onto this subspace S. And we didn't have to do any tricky inverting because we chose an orthonormal basis for our subspace. And that means that our projection matrix is nothing more than A times A transpose.